Recording by John Burlinson. The End of All by Nim Crinkle. The difficulty that I experience in complying with your request, dear spirit, springs from the terrestrial limitations of thought and expression, from which, as you may well know, I have not been long enough with you to free myself. I shall, however, give you a plain narrative of the events attending the extinction of life on our planet, asking you only to remember that I am doing it just as I would have done it, were it possible, for a fellow human being while on earth. Using the phraseology and the terrestrial time divisions, with which I am most familiar. The circumstance which at our last intercourse I was trying to explain to you was simply this. In the early summer of the year 1892, a sudden interruption of navigation occurred on the Pacific coast, which, curiously enough, attracted very little attention outside of scientific circles. I was living at the house of my wealthy friend Judge Brisbane, in Gramercy Park. To tell you the truth, I was in love with his beautiful daughter, of whom I shall have to speak more fully to you, for she was intimately associated with me in the appalling scenes which you desire me to describe. I was sitting in the judge's library on the night of June 25th, his daughter was present, and I had been conversing with her in an undertone while the judge read the evening papers. He suddenly laid down the paper, took off his spectacles, and, turning round in his chair, said to me, "'Did you see the brief dispatch in the morning papers two days ago from San Francisco?' saying that all the eastern-bound vessels were overdue on that coast? I replied at once that I had not noticed it. "'It is astonishing,' he said, "'that in our present system of journalism the most important events connected with the welfare of mankind receive the slightest attention from the newspapers.' and the trivialities of life are most voluminously treated. A movement in the iron trade that affects millions of homes gets a brief paragraph in small type, and the quarrel of a ballet girl with her paramour receives illuminated attention down whole columns. Here is something taking place in the Pacific Ocean of surpassing interest to the race, and nobody pays the slightest attention to it, except, perhaps, the consignees and shipping clerks. What is it, we both asked, with the languid interest that young people, having an overmastering personal affair on hand, would be apt to take in matters of national or universal importance? The judge got up, and going to a side-table where he kept his papers piled in chronological order, pulled out a recent issue of a morning journal, and after looking it over searchingly a moment, said, "'Here, I should think you would notice such a paragraph as this.' Then he read, as I recollect, a telegraphic dispatch to this effect. "'San Francisco, June 23rd considerable anxiety is felt here in commercial circles by the non-arrival of any eastward-bound vessels for a week. The steamship Cathay of the Occidental Line is overdue four days. An unusual easterly wind has been blowing for twenty-four hours. Weather mild. That dispatch you will perceive, said the judge, was sent two days ago. Now, here, on the 25th, I read in the evening paper another dispatch from San Francisco, hidden away at the bottom of a column of commercial news. Listen to this. San Francisco, June 25th. The entire suspension of travel from the West 
continues to excite the gravest apprehensions nothing but coastwise vessels have come in during the past eight days the u s cruiser mobo left honolulu three weeks ago for this coast there is no official intimation of a storm in the chinese seas the judge laid the paper down and regarded us both a moment in silence as if expecting to hear some remark that indicated our suddenly awakened curiosity i don't think we responded with any adequate interest to the occasion miss brisbane did indeed stare at her father in her dreamy abstracted way a moment and then got up and going to the open window began to arrange the curtains as if relinquishing whatever problem there was to the superior acumen of the masculine mind i think i said that it looked as if there had been a cyclone somewhere and if there had we should in all probability get the accounts of it soon enough but young man replied the judge with his magisterial emphasis cyclones do not extend from the fiftieth degree of north latitude to the fortieth degree of south latitude and vessels are due at san francisco from melbourne and japan what then other than a storm at sea could have caused the detention of all these vessels i asked and i must have unwittingly betrayed in the tone of my voice or the expression of my face that considerate superciliousness with which youth regards the serious notions of mature philosophers for the judge putting his gold spectacles upon his nose and regarding me over the top of them a moment said rather severely other than the known and regular phenomena of this planet do not interest young men if i could answer your question there would be no special interest in the matter i mention these trivial incidents because insignificant as they may seem they were the first ripples of that disaster which was soon enough to overwhelm us all and to show you what were the only premonitions the world had of the events which were to follow on june twenty sixth the subject did not occur to me a hundred other things of far more immediate consequence to me occupied my attention a young man who is preparing to get married is not apt to take sombre views of anything nor is he very apt to allow the contumacy of age in his prospective father-in-law to aggravate him it was a pardonable freak i thought in a man who had retired in most respects from the active world to dogmatize a little about that world now that he judged it through his favorite evening paper when therefore on the night of the twenty sixth while at the tea-table the judge broke out again about the meteorological wave on the pacific coast his daughter kate and i exchanged a rapid but furtive glance which said in the perfect understanding of lovers there comes the old gentleman's new hobby again and we can well afford to treat it leniently the judge had the damp evening paper in his hand and he disregarded the steaming cup of tea which his daughter had poured for him well he said with a toss of self-satisfied import now the newspapers are waking up to the significance of the california news he then read from the paper as nearly as i can recollect something like the following san francisco june twenty sixth there is an intense and growing anxiety on this coast with respect to the non-appearance of any eastward bound vessels the breeze from the east continues and is unprecedented now i should like to know said the judge as he laid down the paper and took up his teacup why a breeze from the east in california 
should be unprecedented because i ventured to remark it usually blows from the sea at this season nonsense exclaimed the judge with vigour a variation for a few days in wind or weather is a common occurrence everywhere fancy a message sent all over the world from the west indies that the trade winds were six days late or a telegram from minnesota that the winter frosts had been interfered with for a week by pleasant sunshine no sir the event of importance to the californian at this moment is the mysterious something that has happened out at sea and there is no excuse for his associating a summer breeze from the east with it except that there is something peculiar about that breeze that associates it in the mind with the predominant mystery i smiled you will pardon me judge but it seems to me i said that you are trying to invest the whole affair with an occult significance that is subjective i suppose that in a few hours the matter will be explained and forgotten in a moment we were in one of those foolish little wrangles in which so far as argument is concerned the younger man is at a great disadvantage when the elder however unreasonable his claims enforces them with the advantage of age and position i remember that the desire to convince kate on the one hand that i was free from what i conceived to be her father's unreasonableness and sustain my independence of views on the other hand led me to say much more than was polite for i exasperated the old gentleman and with a curt and not altogether complimentary remark he got up and left the room the moment he was gone i turned to the daughter and laughingly said well my dear i am afraid i have offended your father without intending it but you at least understand me and are free from his superstition to my surprise she regarded me with a serious air and replied i do not know what you mean by superstition my father believes that something has happened and i feel that he is right you do not mean to tell me i said that you believe anything has happened that can concern us she made no reply i looked at her with some astonishment and wondered if i had offended her by opposing her father's childish views perhaps i persisted you too think i am stupidly unreasonable because i will not consent to be dishonestly chimerical i well remember the look of sad reproach with which she silently regarded me and i well remember too the thought that came into my mind i said to myself this is the same obduracy that her father has shown odd it is that i never noticed the trait in her before then i added with an equal obduracy that i was not conscious of perhaps you too have discovered some peculiarity of good sense in me that is offensive and you are afraid that something will happen if we here she interrupted me in her quiet resolute and reproachful way something has happened she said i was amazed if i had suddenly discovered that the woman i loved was unfaithful to me it could not have produced in my frame of mind at that moment a greater shock it seemed to me then that the wooing of months the confidence and affection of a year were to be sacrificed in a moment of infatuated stubbornness the very thought was so unnatural that it produced a revulsion in my own feelings my darling i said as i went toward her impulsively we are playing the unworthy part of fools nothing can ever happen that will make us love each other less or prevent you from being my wife i put my arm around her in the old familiar way she was passive and irresponsive 
she stood there limply holding the curtain with one white arm upraised her beautiful head bent over and her eyes cast down so that i could not look into her face this stony obduracy was so new and unlike her that i withdrew my arm and stepped back a little to regard her with astonishment not unmingled with pique at that moment she lifted her head slowly and as she looked at me with a dreamy and far-away pathos i saw that her eyes were filled with tears it seems to me she said with a voice that sounded as if it was addressed to an invisible phantom way beyond me it seems to me that i shall never be your wife i must have stared at her several seconds in silence then i said you are ill you are not yourself when you have recovered your normal condition i will come back or snatched a kiss from her lips that were strangely cold and rushed from the house it was not till the next morning when i woke up after a short and disturbed sleep that my mind reverted to the cause of all this purely sentimental disagreement and i felt a strong desire to have events prove that the judge was slightly monomaniacal and that i was right i went to riccadonna's for my breakfast and got all the morning papers as usual but this time with a distinct confidence that the news would be the best vindication of my good sense and that i should yet have a good laugh at the judge i opened the paper as i sipped my coffee and the first thing my eyes fell on were the headlines of a dispatch from st louis i read them with an inexplicable sense of something sinking in me as i recall them they ran as follows strange news from the west all communication west of salt lake city ceases meteorological puzzle what is the matter with the wires then followed the dispatch which i have not forgotten st louis june twenty sixth eight p m a dispatch received here from yuma on the texas pacific announces that no eastern bound train has come in since morning and all attempts to open communication by telegraph with points west of that place have failed it is the opinion of railroad men that a great storm is raging in california weather here pleasant with a steady dry wind from the east blowing immediately following this was another news item which i can quote from memory denver june twenty sixth nine p m intelligence from cheyenne is to the effect that railway travel and telegraphic communication west of pocatello on the union pacific and ogden and on the central pacific have been interrupted by a storm the telegraph wires are believed to be in good condition but up to nine o'clock there has been no return current i read these paragraphs over three or four times ordinarily i should have passed them by and given any attention to other and more congenial news but now a dull fear that events were conspiring to widen the breach between myself and the brisbans focused my interest on them there was that easterly wind blowing again was i too growing superstitious i turned over all the papers the news was the same in all but there was not an editorial paragraph of comment in any of the sheets which indeed teemed with all the details of active commercial political and social life i went downtown after eating my breakfast and found that the intelligence had not awakened any public attention that was observable the two or three persons to whom i spoke with regard to it treated it as one of the passing sensations of the hour 
that would be explained sooner or later. It was not till the evening papers of the 27th came out that the matter began to be discussed. The dispatches in these papers were of a nature to arouse widespread anxiety. It was very obvious from their construction and import that the feeling west of the Mississippi was more intense than had up to this time been suspected. The columns of the papers were filled with brief but rather startling telegrams from various points. Denver, El Paso, Salt Lake City, Cheyenne, St. Paul, St. Louis, and Chicago sent anxious sentences which had a thrill of trepidation in their broken phrases and it was easy to see that this feeling of deep concern increased with each dispatch from a point further west. Telegrams sent to St. Louis, Chicago, and St. Paul represented the condition of anxiety in Ogden and Pocatello to be bordering on excitement. Fears were entertained, the dispatches said, of a meteorological cataclysm, and thousands who had friends either on the coast or in transit were besieging the telegraph offices in vain. The hurried comments of the evening papers on the news were singularly unsatisfactory and non-committal. The unprecedented storm that is now raging on the Pacific Slope, I read, and which has temporarily cut off communications with the far west, will by its magnitude fill the country with the most serious apprehensions. The earliest news from California, which shall give us the details of the storm, said another paper, will be looked for with eagerness, and will be promptly and fully furnished to our readers as curious as anybody could be to know what kind of a storm it was that had stopped railroad traffic from Idaho to Mexico, and remarking with surprise that the signal office utterly refused to recognize a great storm anywhere, I dismissed the subject from my mind with the reflection that there would in all probability be explanatory news in the morning and resolved to make my usual visit to the Brisbane family. To my surprise, Kate received me cordially, and with no other allusion to the unpleasantness of the night before than a demure remark that she was afraid she had offended me. Let us not refer to it at all, I said, and thus avoid making idiots of ourselves. I am glad you came to-night, she remarked, after a moment's silence for I wanted to tell you of the change we are going to make. A little pang darted through me. It was said so seriously. "'What is it, my dear?' I asked, trying to be as affectionate as if the conditions had not changed. "'My father and I have determined to go to Europe.' "'To Europe?' I repeated, aghast. "'You surely do not mean it.' Yes, resolutely. He wanted to consult you about it, but was afraid you would disagree with his plans. And when did he make up his mind to take this sudden move? This morning. And you intend to go with him? Yes, and I was going to ask you to go, too. When do you propose to go? Immediately. It was evident to my mind now that this old man was a panic-stricken monomaniac, and had infected his daughter with his fears. "'Kate,' I said as I took her by her hands, and pulled her to the sofa beside me, "'you are running away from something. It is not from me, is it? I want you to go with us,' she answered. "'But you knew when you asked me that I could not go so suddenly. You expected me to refuse.' No, she said, I expect you to consent. Be careful. In a moment of bravado, I may take you at your word, at any cost. She caught hold of me. Do, 
she said tremulously, and I felt a little shiver in her hand. Do, do. I would rather go with you than lose you, I said at a hazard. And if you are determined to go, I believe I will accompany you if your father will consent. We are determined, she calmly replied. But I must put my affairs in order, I suggested. How many hours will it take you? Hours, I repeated. You would not like to start tonight, surely? Yes, she answered. I would gladly start tonight. My patience was giving way very fast at this imperturbable obduracy. Perhaps, I said, you will give me some adequate reason for a haste that I cannot comprehend. She did not answer. She was listening, with her head averted, and she held up her hand for me to listen also, as if that were her answer. Then there came through the open windows the hoarse cry of a distant newsboy who was bellowing an extra. There was something weird in her attitude and action, connecting, as they did, her motives with that discordant, ominous cry. "'It's an extra,' I said, as unconcernedly as possible. "'I'll get a copy. There may be some good news for you.' And I made a move toward the window. "'Don't,' she said quietly. "'We were talking about going to Europe. Pa is not familiar with the business of securing passages, and you are. You could relieve him of a great deal of worry. And if you would go with us, Kate?' I said, do you want me to go? Yes, I do, she replied. I do not want to leave you here. Then I said I will go. I will see your father in the morning and tell him that I will attend to the whole business of securing passages. I will set about arranging my affairs at once. She then let me plague her a little about her timidity, and after a half-hour of playful badinage on my part, I came away with a parting promise on my lips to lose no delay in making the arrangements for our departure. Such, however, was not my intention. I felt sure that the judge and his daughter would change their minds if I could only manage to delay matters a few days. To go running off to Europe at a moment's notice would be utter folly for me. As I left the house I heard the voices of the newsboys in various keys still calling the extras. I bought a paper and read it under the gaslight of the church on 20th Street. Display headlines announced, As silent as the grave, nothing heard from the Pacific. Great excitement in Chicago and St. Louis. I must have stood there ten minutes poring over the strange news. An expedition in a special train had been sent west from Yuma that day, with railroad men and doctors. It had left at 3 p.m. The train reached Mesquite in less than an hour, and word was sent back from that station, All right here, track clear, will reach the springs at 9 p.m. A dispatch from Yuma sent at 10 o'clock and received at St. Louis said, Nothing further heard from the special. News from Chicago, where the excitement appeared to be momentarily growing, reflected intelligence from Denver, St. Paul, and Kansas City, and it was vain to ignore the fact that the entire West was in an alarming condition of anxiety. A special train was fitting out at Cheyenne under government orders to start in the morning with a corps of signal service men, army officers, and electricians. It was to go provided with every scientific appliance, and to carry an insulated cable to be paid out from the car. The accounts said that the people were all on the streets of Cheyenne, and that enormous mobs surrounded the station where the preparations were making. For the first time I felt, as I threw the paper away, 
what I can only call a sense of misgiving. As I walked up the deserted avenue this feeling grew upon me, and when I reached 23rd Street, on my way to the Fifth Avenue Hotel, a sudden and entirely new reflection made me stop unconsciously as I turned it over in my mind. If this strange news has affected Judge Brisbane and his daughter so seriously, why may it not be affecting millions of other people similarly? If there is at this moment a panic in the West, how long will it take the reflex wave to reach New York? The next morning events, or at least the publication of them, had reached that condition which arrests public attention everywhere. The news from the West swamped all else in the morning journals. The editors, by their work, now acknowledged that the mysterious silence on the Pacific Slope was by far the most important subject for consideration before the world. The moment I glanced at the sheets, I saw that there was but one theme in the journalistic mind. Two days had passed, and the silence was unbroken. Never before in the history of the world had the absence of news become such important news. Public attention was now mainly centered on the attempt to get a train of observation through from Cheyenne. There was a hopeful spirit to most of the accounts, as if it was believed that science would unravel the mystery but there was nothing from any quarter of the globe that as yet afforded the feeblest gleam of comfort. The government train was to start early on this, the morning of the 28th, and the papers were only able to furnish details of the preparation and reports of the public excitement in Cheyenne and Denver. The officers of the train were to send dispatches from every station west of Pocatello. They were sagacious, experienced men, and the expedition was under the direction of the well-known engineer, General Albert Carroll. I felt as I read the accounts that these men would probably clear up the mystery, and I resolved to delay engaging the passages on the ocean steamer until the next day so I wrote a carefully worded note to Judge Brisbane, informing him that I would attend to the matter immediately. Had I then had the slightest knowledge of the cumulative rapidity with which a panic moves, I would not have taken this risk. But my whole object was to gain time, with the hope that something would occur to change the minds of my two timid friends. On the night of the 28th I avoided the Brisbane establishment, although my desire drew me in that direction. I resolved to wait until the morrow, and if nothing happened, to change the determination of the judge to go to Europe, to then make my arrangements to go with him and Kate. That night there was a visible change in the metropolis. The theatres were deserted. Men and women were congregated at the corners and were walking in the roadways, a sure indication in a great city of some popular disturbance. The bulletins and news centers were crowded, and the mystery of the great silence was being discussed by everybody. One thing struck everybody with a vague terror, and it was the accounts of the strange wind that was now blowing at Cheyenne and Denver. One special correspondent at Cheyenne said that it seemed to him that the atmosphere of the earth, influenced by some incomprehensible suction, was all rushing to an unseen vortex. It was not in any sense a disturbance of the atmosphere that we usually call a wind, but a steady, silent draught. And the spectacle of trees bent over and held all day by the pressure, but unfluttered and unrelieved by fluctuant variations, filled them with wonder and dread. 
I got up early on the morning of the twenty-ninth, for I had slept lightly and fitfully. To my surprise I found that almost everybody else was up. It made me realize, as I had not done before, the feverish tension of public expectation. The news, if news it can be called, was startling. Let me try and repeat it to you just as it was presented to my sense. The special train upon which the eyes of the whole country were fixed had been heard from. It had gone west from Cheyenne and passed through Pocatello without interruption. Then followed the dispatches received from it at Cheyenne as it passed the stations beyond Pocatello. They were in this order and to this effect. Mikano, 10 a.m. All right. Instruments working well. Track clear. Inhabitants appear to be moving east. No intelligence of a definite character obtained. Shoshone, 108 miles west. Expect to make it in four hours. Bannock, 2.30 p.m. Conditions unchanged. Past moving settlers all the way. They are going east with chattels. Wind from the east has pressure without the violence of a gale. Party in good spirits. Sunshine, 315. Vast herds of wild cattle now impeding progress. Wind increasing. Road otherwise clear. American Falls, 440. Signs of the exodus decreasing. Country strewn with household goods. Reports here that all the teams that went out on the roads west have not returned. Expect to hear something definite from Minidoka. Minidoka, 610. Electrical and barometrical indications unchanged. Signs of life disappearing. Party in excellent spirits and eager to reach the facts. The next dispatch was from Cheyenne, and it was sent at eight o'clock. It simply said, Nothing further heard from government party. Wire in good order. Then followed two telegrams of gruesome brevity and significance. Pocatello, 9 p.m. Nothing here. Cheyenne, 10 p.m. Nothing has come over the special wire up to this hour. Microphonic tests at Pocatello indicate that the train is still moving. Electrical tests indicate that the current is unbroken. Finally, there was a special message from the New York Star's correspondence at Cheyenne, dated 11 p.m. It was about to this effect. The current on the government wire was broken at 10.40. Delicate tests show that the wire is now grounded. The dire conclusion of experts here is that the train ran from some point west of Minidoka from about 6.15 to 10.40 without human control and then met with an accident. At the rate at which it was moving, the train must have reached Shoshone. Terrible excitement here. My keen sense detected in the newspaper itself certain infallible little signs that the news had disturbed the precision and routine of the office. Lines of type were in the wrong place, and typographical errors made it difficult to get the exact sense. Dispatch after dispatch, all bearing the same import of panic, was huddled into the column. From St. Louis the announcement was, An unprecedented excitement here over the news from Cheyenne. The authorities appear to have lost their heads, and are unable to preserve order. Eastward-bound trains are carrying away people at a mob rate. We are in the midst of chaos. From Chicago the intelligence was similarly appalling. A panic prevails here, said the dispatch. 
impelled by a senseless apprehension of disaster, people have lost their reason. The mayor has just issued a call upon the best citizens to assist him in preserving order. It required no news expert to see that all the issues of life were temporarily suspended by the tremendous and growing interest in this stupendous mystery. Channels of news worn smooth by the placid streams of everyday platitudes began to show the role of this new freshet. A dispatch from Washington was unintentionally significant. It read like this. The only explanation forwarded by Colonel Sandford of the abandonment of the Pikes Peak signal station by himself and party is that of a coward. He says the wind pressure indicated that the place would speedily become untenable. I turned over the sheet in which these disheartening facts were presented and looked at the editorial page. There was a double-leaded leader, evidently written late at night, and its conclusions were more gruesome than the facts. For while the facts could be interpreted in various ways according to the reader's condition of mind, there was no mistaking the official tone of the editor, whose business it was to weigh and estimate the public value of news. It seemed to me that this umpire, to whom we instinctively looked for opinions, had thrown up the sponge, so to speak, let me recall his words as they were impressed upon me that morning. That a grave crisis has arrived in the conditions of life on this planet, it would be folly and is impossible any longer to deny. It is not our province, nor is it within our power, to offer any solution of the stupendous mystery that is now enveloping a part of our continent. It is only imperative upon us, as brave agents in the dispensing of truth, to say with all the candor that we can summon, that the effort of the government to open communication with the vast region west of what must now be known as the meridian of silence has dismally failed, and it is the conviction of the maturest judgment, based upon all the facts of the attempt, that are obtainable, that it failed because the explorers themselves ceased to exist when they had passed a certain pretty well-defined line, which we now know extends north and south from Helena in Montana to Yuma on the borders of Mexico. I found myself standing by my breakfast table reading this. I had risen unconsciously, my breakfast was unheeded. An ungovernable impulse to go anywhere seized me. To sit still with this crushing uncertainty was impossible. I found myself in a coupé. Where I got it I do not distinctly remember, but I do remember that it was by means of an extraordinary offer to the driver, who, like all his fellows, was dashing through the streets at a headlong pace, and I also have a very clear recollection of the strange nervous effect produced upon me by seeing the people along the curbs on Broadway watching the flying vehicles with a mute terror, as if the very recklessness of the drivers afforded them a palpable distraction from the unintelligible weight of their own fears. I speedily noticed that the stream of humanity on the streets was tending downtown, and almost immediately I understood that it was heading, like myself, for the news centers. I could get no farther than Chambers Street, owing to the block of people and vehicles, and the driver rudely refused to take the risk of a jam. I looked at the City Hall clock. It was only eight. My heart was beating rapidly, and I knew enough of the effect of emotion on the cardiac system to understand that it was caused by suspense. 
a thousand new terrors were in the air of which the experience and the sagacity of man were ignorant i forced my way with the greatest difficulty across the park which was full of restless but strangely mute people and got near enough to the newspaper bulletins to read the painted lines they were feverishly indicative of the cross currents of excitement in the country and were in short decisive sentences like this the president asked to appoint a day of humiliation and prayer immediately the governor of colorado crazed by the excitement commits suicide mob rule in chicago rioting in denver breakdown of the alton and chicago road unparalleled scenes at el paso fanaticism in new orleans the christian pastors of this city will meet at cooper union at ten o'clock irrespective of sect panic in milwaukee held by a numbing sort of fascination i read these sentences over and over across printing-house square on another bulletin in big black letters i saw the line it baffles the world has annihilation set in there was something weird in the use of the pronoun it it seemed to be man's last effort in language to express a mystery that was specific and yet incomprehensible and i found that by the common consent of ignorance men were referring to the phenomenon as it i looked at the strained anxious faces of the mob and a great fear fell upon me with it came an awful reproach i would go instantly and redeem my word to kate by securing passages to europe i had to fight my way by inches out of the stolid and frightened crowd to the steamship office on lower broadway and there i found another jam the street was full of private carriages and it was impossible to get anywhere near the entrance to the office i saw a policeman who was on the outside of the press and who was walking up and down in a restless and unofficial manner what is the matter here i asked him he looked me all over as if he suspected that i had fallen out of the clouds then he said trying to get tickets for europe where do you come from and then after a restless turn or two he added as he passed me but it ain't no use cause there ain't steamships enough in the world then it was i think that the whole terrible truth first lit my consciousness like the sudden upflaring of a bale fire the inhabitants were fleeing from the country they were all affected as had been the brisbans i was the only dolt and idiot and liar who had no instincts of danger and who had failed to rescue the woman i loved when she had appealed to me then i plunged wildly out into the street with a sense of desperation and that sinking of the spirits that comes only in the worst crises and when one begins to comprehend how helpless man is i saw that in the brief time that had elapsed a change had taken place in the aspect of the crowds when i got to broadway again it was with the utmost difficulty that i could make my way at all against the surging mass of people that seemed momentarily to swell it was utterly unlike any crowd in numbers and disposition that i had ever encountered it was made up of all classes it had lost that american characteristic of good humor which had been swallowed up in a dire personal and selfish instinct of self-preservation it was animated by a vague terror and disregarded every consideration but that of personal safety a horrible conviction seized me that the ordinary restraints of society were breaking down 
and that speedily panic would mount to chaos. I saw that this dread was adding to the terror of everybody, aside from the fear of it. Like an assemblage in a burning building, the fear of each other was more subtle and operative than the fear of the elements. By indefatigable labor, I got off the main thoroughfare and reached Hudson Street, and here in the crowd I learned the latest news and discovered the cause of the rapidly increasing excitement. I had run against an intimate friend and associate by accident. His first words were, as he wiped the perspiration out of his eyes, "'Well, this is awful, eh?' "'What's the news?' I asked. "'The latest is that the death line has moved. "'The Thurbers have a private wire, "'and I just heard that Denver is cut off now. "'It looks as if it was every man for himself.' "'So terrible was this announcement, "'and so engrossed was I with the despairing thoughts "'that it gave rise to, "'that I took little heed of what was going on about me until I reached Canal Street. The one dull conviction that it was useless to fight against now was that annihilation had set in, that some destroying wave had started out to encircle the globe, and that the race was doomed. Something, God alone knew what, had happened to our planet, and humanity was to be swept away in one of those cataclysms with which soulless nature prepares for a new order of existence. I was rudely awakened from this reverie of wretchedness by the crowd which surged against me with a blind, unvindictive violence. My one desire was to get uptown to the woman I loved and had neglected, and I saw that every minute was adding to the difficulty. How I reached the Brevoort house I do not know, but there I found a number of citizens who had not utterly lost their heads, and who had come together for counsel. There was a private wire in the house, and they were receiving intelligence from several central points in the city. The looks of these men, who were huddled into the parlor, were enough to dismay the most resolute observer. Their pale faces and painfully set mouths indicated the sense of an awful crisis, which wisdom did not know how to meet or avoid. A well-known citizen read the dispatches to them as they were received, and, torn as I was by impatience, my curiosity held me there to hear. It was now about half-past eleven in the morning. The rapidity with which events had moved since I got up was made startlingly apparent by the information here furnished. The authorities, together with a number of influential citizens, had come together as if by a common instinct at the Fifth Avenue Hotel. The mayor, the police and fire commissioners, several wealthy bankers, and a number of prominent clergymen were holding some kind of council and sending out appeals for cooperation and addresses to the public, which later were entirely unheeded. As I forced myself into the room I saw and heard a venerable and majestic gentleman evidently a clergyman, addressing those present in an impassioned manner. There were tears in his eyes and an awful sadness in his voice. "'Men and brethren,' he said, "'it is appointed unto all men once to die. If it be appointed unto us, who remain to die together, let us die like Christians, who still retain our faith in eternal justice and eternal mercy, and not like wild beasts that devour each other.' A report came that the fatal east wind was blowing, and at this there was a general movement of those present, as if the time were too short to waste in longer listening. I came up Lafayette Place to Astor Place, with the intention of reaching Fourth Avenue. Both spaces were choked with people, and on Eighth Street I saw a woman on the steps of a private residence, wildly calling on the mob, which paid no attention to her, to repent for the day of judgment was at hand. Her white hair was blown over her face, and her arms were frantically gesticulating. Into the great hall of the Cooper Union a mass of religious people had flocked, 
and a number of speakers were making addresses and offering up prayers. When I passed the woman who was exhorting the crowd, I had noticed the manner in which her hair, which was of soft, flossy white, streamed out straight in front of her, but it did not occur to me until I reached the square in front of the Cooper Union that this was caused by the peculiar and ominous draught of wind from the east, of which I had heard so much for it was there that I saw a crowd pointing up to the roof of the vast building known as the Bible House, which appeared to be covered with people. Some of them were holding flags and drapery, and the material floated out westward without any of the undulating motion which always marks a flag in a disturbed current. These extemporized pennants stood out as if they were starched, I could see that this sign produced a dumb sort of terror in the crowd. It seemed to me then that all the emotion of which I was capable was centered on the one desire to get to the woman I loved and die with her. A crushing and at the same time an animating remorse, as if somehow I had been responsible for her death, at least, in disregarding her warnings and somehow doubly guilty in mistrusting her motives, unmanned and inflamed me. It was with something of the same disregard of everybody but myself that I had seen in others that I fought my way to 21st Street. What brutalities I committed need not be recounted. That hour remains with me an acute and jangled memory of frenzy. I reached the steps of Judge Brisbane's house torn and bleeding. The terrible scenes were in my eyes, and the dreadful, monotonous tumult of human desperation, that vast sigh of doomed humanity, pierced here and there by the wails and shrieks of despair and the cries of innocence for help, was in my ears. The celerity with which it had all come on left no chance for cool reason. An invisible phantom was at the heels of the community, and we were part of a mighty stampede. After fumbling for an instant at the bell and pushing back several ghastly creatures who were on the steps, I must have applied my shoulder to the door and pushed it in. Someone appeared to be resisting on the other side, but it gave way and I half fell into Judge Brisbane's vestibule. An instant later we were looking into each other's faces, I bloody and soiled and ragged and wild with the frenzy of fear and impatience, he pale as death but resolute and holding an ominous bar over me. "'Quick,' he said, "'help me fasten this door.' That sudden call of duty struck something habitual in me, and without knowing exactly what I was doing, I found myself assisting him in barricading the door. The endeavor somewhat changed the current of my thoughts from the danger that was unseen to the danger that was storming under our windows. I must have muttered some kind of excuse for my conduct to the judge, for he said, "'No time for apologies or recriminations now.' The house is full of my neighbors, who have come here for protection. Go upstairs and look after the women. The best and only thing we can do is to preserve a quiet place to die in, and not be trampled to pieces. Are you armed? I dashed up the broad staircase, and found the upper rooms occupied by women, some of whom, in mourning attire, hastily thrown on, were sitting around with their heads in their hands, while others were huddled at the windows, staring with strained looks of terror at the crowds on the street. Walking up and down the room, wringing his hands, a middle-aged man was giving expression to the most terrible irony and cowardice, without reference to his listeners. I ran my eye over the huddled groups of frightened women, the one I sought was not there. I flew through the groaning figures on the stairway up to her chamber. I knocked loudly and called her by name passionately. Then I listened. I heard nothing but the dull sounds of the human tumult 
that came through the open casement and the sighing tones of the telegraph wires as the steady draught from the east swept through them i shook the door and abjured her to come to me then in my madness i burst it in she was on her knees at the bed with her hands on her ears and her head buried in the bedclothes i fell down on my knees beside her and put my arm around her kate i said we will die together look up love at least is eternal she was cold i caught her head between my hands and turned her beautiful face toward me my god she was dead dead with her staring eyes full of terror and her beautiful mouth set in hard and ghastly lines then it was that i felt rise up within me for the first time the rebellious bitterness of the natural man need i tell you that at such moments man is little better than an animal save in his free agency that enables him to defy i passed hours there moaning cursing bewailing when at last the force of the paroxysm had expended itself i shook my fist in the face of heaven with the obduracy of pagan greek and said come on now you envious fates and do your worst speedily or i will be too quick for you judge brisbane found me there raving do you know i asked yes he answered and i am grateful she is spared much that we must endure and so i said life love and the vaunted future of the race end in mockery it seems so he replied but we cannot be sure come with me we ascended to the roof the spectacle that greeted us was indescribable the tops of all the houses were black with people who were staring mutely and with childish terror into the west the steady subdued organ tone of the rushing atmosphere could now be heard above all else we stood there in silence a few moments and then i said it's terrible what do you suppose is taking place i suppose replied the judge that we are losing our atmosphere reeling it off so to speak slowly as we revolve our planet has entered some portion of the ethereal space where the conditions are sucking us dry of oxygen as it recedes from the earth the water disappears and we shall be left to revolve like the moon without air and without liquid and consequently without life he said this meditatively less as if he were answering my question than if he were formulating his own fears then i remarked if this takes place gradually the millions have got to struggle and writhe and fight together in suffocation we can at least blow our brains out and cheat such a fate i should hate said the judge to think that the man who was to marry kate had not the bravery to face his destiny that was all that was said we came down and some ripples of intelligence reached us during the afternoon from one or two persons who made their way into the house we learned that in the frenzy of fear the populace were committing the most extraordinary excesses the shoreline of the atlantic was crowded with people many of whom plunged into the ocean in the vain attempt to get away the scenes in the city were too revolting to narrate for a large class of the community released from all restraint of moral and civil law were bent on securing all the lawless pleasures that force could command during the few hours that was left to them and the line was steadily coming east chicago was cut off at twelve o'clock and at four intelligence had ceased coming from buffalo at this time 
the sound of the winds was like the roar of the sea i had torn myself away from the window where i had been staring at the now packed and struggling masses of people and had locked myself in the room with the dead body of kate there was a vial of opium on her table which had been used for neuralgia i swallowed it and sat down by the bedside i know not how long i remained there but a loud report as of a discharged cannon roused me i remember staggering and panting in the dark with a semi-consciousness that the end had come and i now know that the report was occasioned by the bursting of the drums of my ears i remember nothing more i have given you a plain statement of my experiences in that crisis and i dare say they are uneventful enough by the side of the experiences of millions. End of the End of All by Nim Crinkle